So it's really great on a Friday uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. Um, it's really great. So um, I really, I um, yeah, first I'd like to introduce our uh, panelists briefly and, um, and uh, begin with some questions. Um, so this is our final panel of a uh, wonderful week, uh, our eighth panel. Uh, we've had two roundtables. Um, and this panel is on performers and performance. So it segues nicely from our, our last panel on in the theater. Um, so I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Veronica Johnson, who teaches film studies at National University of Ireland and Galway. She's currently working on a project on the er early Irish film industry with a focus on the Film Company of Ireland. She's published in Historical Journal of Film, Radio and TV, and her, her talk is entitled The Craft of, uh, her, her presentation was on The Craft of Irish Acting, the Abbey Theatre and the Film Company of Ireland. Uh, Doron Galilili uh, is a research fellow in the Department of Media Studies at Stockholm University. Um, Doron is the author of uh, the, the long-awaited and absolute uh, masterful work, uh, Seeing by Electricity, the Emergence of Television, 1878 to 1939 from Duke and a co-editor of our last conference proceedings uh, just prior to, to um, uh, Rochester. The, uh, so our penultimate, uh, the corporality, uh, corp sorry, um, uh, corporality in Early Cinema, Viscera, Skin and Physical Form. Uh, from our 2016 conference in Stockholm. And his talk, it, uh, was his presentation was The Craft of Silent Film Acting, um, Classical Traditions and Modern Innovations. Elise Singer is a doctoral candidate in theater and performance with a film study certificate at CUNY Graduate Center in New York. She is the recipient of multiple awards, including a 2018 Domator special commendation for her essay, Pauvre Folle, which connects nicely with today, and the 2019 SEMS Women's Caucus Graduate Writing Prize, the 2020 Helen Crick Chinoy Dissertation Fellowship, the 2020, 2021 Huntington Fellowship, and she has published in uh, Journal of Performance and Art, Studies in Musical Theater, and is forthcoming in Feminist Media Histories. Um, Maggie Hennefeld is Associate Professor of Cultural Studies and Comparative, oh sorry, Elisa's talk is entitled Methodologies for Madness, Instructions for Emotional Expression in Early Motion Picture Acting Manuals. And our, our final panelist, uh, because uh, Ozde uh, uh, unfortunately will not be able to join us today. Our final panelist is uh, Maggie Hennefeld. She's an associate professor of cultural studies and comparative literature, McKnight Presidential Fellow Hi. at University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities. She's the author of the award-winning Specters of Slapstick and Silent Film Comedienne at Columbia University Press, co-editor of Cultural Critique uh, Journal and uh, of two fabulous volumes, Unwatchable and uh, Abjection Incorporated, Mediating the Politics of Pleasure and Violence uh, from 2020. She's preparing a DVD Blu-ray set uh, from a, a program uh, from the Portanone Film Festival, uh, Cinema's First on Cinema's First Nasty Women, and a second monograph on the, the history of women who allegedly died from laughing too hard. Ha! <laughs> so, um, Maggie Hennefeld's talk is uh, Hysterical Neurologists, Clownist Convalescence, and Early Cinema's Visual Cure. So, I would like to uh, begin. Um, with a couple of questions, I'd like to begin by welcoming our panelists, welcoming you all back for our final panel. And um, I would like to begin with a couple of questions for uh, Veronica and, uh, and Doron, and then uh, with some questions for Elise and Maggie. And then I invite you also to, in the meantime to put some of your questions in the chat and also our panelists if you would like to share any questions and those will all be translated. So, um, okay, so Veronica, um, uh, uh, your your presentation, or your talk was on uh, your, uh, two stage actors uh, who had turned uh, directors. That's uh, Kerrigan and, and O'Donovan. O'Donovan. Um, and um, 
there's just there's some wonderful correspondences between uh, the first two uh, presentations by Veronica and Doron. Um, so uh, my first comment and question is that you know, often theatrical acting is uh, set in opposition to cinema acting during this early period. Um, of course. And uh, so I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about uh, the precise exchange between uh, natural style, the natural style adopted by the Abbey Theatre and early Irish cinema that you, that you refer to. Um, uh, you, um, so you say that these are, these are uh, you also talk about how they're complemented by, that they complemented the Celtic revival play and, and emphasized um, stillness, spoken word, and carefully choreographed movement. So I'm wondering if you can uh, tell us a little bit about uh, these techniques, uh, types of source documents, um, because I find that was a common thing uh, in all of the papers, but uh, particularly in the paper of Veronica and Doron, is the difficulty of writing about something you cannot see, uh, along with, you know, of course, that happens in the theater. Um, I find it quite challenging to write about theater. Um, uh, merci de tendre vos microphones, si possible. Merci. The, um, so, can you uh, tell us a little bit about techniques and uh, uh, th these techniques? And um, if unique in U the UK at the time, as you say, uh, when and where uh, did this natural style come from? What were the influences? Uh, of course, we know of Antoine, Andre Antoine's naturalist theater in France. Uh, which then segued into La Lune Pose Symbolist Theater. Uh, Ibsen also uh, was practicing kind of realist uh, uh, theater um, uh, in Norway. Um, so I'm wondering uh, what was the exchange here uh, between uh, this natural style, uh, again, and early Irish cinema and what were the influences? Thank you, Tommy. Um, can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I wanted to say um, I'm ridiculously excited to be here. Um, it's wonderful. It's my first Dometer. Um, I'm really glad and grateful that um, my paper was accepted, and I want to say congratulations. The conference has been particularly wonderful. Um, so, so bravo. Um, thank you for the great, great question. Um, yeah, this is something that I am trying to um, to negotiate to to discover at the at the moment. Um, so the Abbey Theatre style is something that um, is uh, quite particular and quite unique. Yes, there's definitely influences from um, uh, mostly other European approaches to a, a natural form of of acting. Um, but there was a, a precursor to the to the Abbey, a small group of um, Irish men and women, they weren't even actors, decided to get together and to start um, performing Irish um, plays. And they developed this style that then went on to become the, the Abbey style. Um, it, it's... It, it always seems to me, although I, I don't think it's been it's been documented in this way, it always seems to me from what I read about it, it's almost a partly a reaction to um, the long tradition of the stage Irish man or the stage Irish woman. Um, so that 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 stereotypical um, character who is um, loud and drunken and slovenly um, um, and, and, and all of these um, characteristics that are um, defined by movement, okay, are, are defined by kind of a, a, a bravado kind of, of movement. And the, the Abbey the Abbey style um, almost strips everything like that away and becomes something that's very um, very refined and very still. And also the other the other part of this is that it's also um, a theatre that focuses so much on the on the spoken word, which I know sounds odd when trying to bring that over to cinema, but it focuses so much on the spoken word because definitely initially it was a theatre of playwrights and poets. 
so the focus was on to try and speak these plays in a poetic style. So for those words which were revered at the time, for those, for those words to be um, spoken in a way that would captivate the audience, um, this was again another reason why the, the, the actors in the Abbey were trained to, um, to be still and the, 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 the actor who was speaking um, was almost the only actor um, who, who, was allowed, um, who was allowed movement. How all that translates into cinema is, um, this is the start of the journey I'm on, okay? Um, but it, it's interesting in the film I chose to talk about, this film called um, Nok Nagao or The Homes of Tipperary, um, you can see um, it, it's almost um, theatrical in its staging. Um, and, and, I, and I know the development of Irish cinema is, is, is kind of one of the later developments of, of cinema. And if you compare it to American cinema of 1918, um, it seems quite old fashioned. Um, I don't think that's only due to um, how late Ireland came to the game in making films. I do think it's because of this actor, Fred O'Donovan, and his, um, um, his uh, training in theatre. Um, and also it's interesting with Fred O'Donovan, he, he, he went on to work with the BBC um, just after the Second World War um, and he was um, a director of uh, plays, the daily play in the BBC and he was known for his one camera technique. So it seemed that that approach to staging um, stayed, stayed with him. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of a bit where it comes from and a bit maybe where it went in the end. Okay. Thank you. That's really, that's that's a very interesting, because there are a lot of, there are some similarities between that and the symbolist, uh, symbolists in, uh, that I'm studying in uh, France during that period, who uh, also uh, focused on stillness and uh, the spoken word was limited, uh, uh, was, but it was often off screen and with an off screen narrator. And, but the stillness was more of a, a realist style, but it was also an abstract style. And it's, it's quite difficult to get descriptions of that style. Uh, it's also a problem of, of sources. I find it very challenging. Um, uh, and uh, the pandemic hasn't helped with that, but I, I do have, I, I was able to get a lot of materials at the BN, uh, but uh, the National Library. Um, but I, I find that, um, it's really interesting that it, it seems that so in, in the con, in the Irish context, it's coming more from a uh, history of poetry and 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 uh, um, and literature as well. So that's that's really really fascinating. Um, so um, so I'll go ahead and, and move to on to my next question, which is for Doron, uh, and maybe we can come back and kind of link and and, and interweave the, these. Uh, um, questions. So um, Doron, whose paper was on uh, the craft of silent film acting, uh, classical and modern, uh, classical traditions and modern innovations, uh, was using a, a lot of wonderful sources actually. Um, and uh, uh, early film acting guidebooks, advice columns and statements uh, of film actors. So, uh, which I've also found to be very uh, useful when we can find the, the kinds of interviews that were taking place and, and also keeping in mind the intermediality and the movement between uh, the different arts at the time between dance and pantomime and theater and film. Um, uh, in the European context and the Hollywood context, because uh, Doran, you focus on early Hollywood from 1913 to 1916 and uh, the new industrial and institutional conditions, uh, the branding of film performers as artists that came with the emergence of the star system and that would become classical Hollywood. Um, I really like your focus on classical versus modern uh, acting um, and I, it, for me, echoed some of the discussions earlier in the week that we had with Jenny uh, oyalan Koloski's um, presentation on Delsartism and Florence Lawrence in early biograph films from 1908 to 1909, in which expressionism was connected to um, the, the modern in, uh, through Delsartism. Uh, but in, of course, we in dance, uh, uh, Isadora Duncan, who was influenced by Delsartism, uh, also incorporates the neoclassical, uh, which is dubbed modern. So my first question is, um, one, how would you define this early classical acting style? I know that's your project. Uh, to what extent is classical acting, this classical acting style with the neoclassical values of decorum, proportion, and harmony that uh, are, that 
uh, you are, are, which I think is really brilliant. You're looking at these classical elements uh, in art, um, the neoclassical elements of, of proportion and harmony. Uh, to what extent are these modern or not modern? Um, what uh, um, is can we really draw an opposition between classical and modern? Are, are there what are the slippages between classical and modern? Um, for example, as in Jenny's paper, and how does one grapple with them? So that's my first question. Uh, my second question for you is what is uh, uh, the relationship to neoclassical or classical theater and how did it fit in with, 19, uh, with the 19 teens Hollywood discourse on cinema as an art and a craft um, in, with uh, modern ideas regarding emotions, um, personalities and screen mediation that you talk about? Hope that those questions are clear. <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, yeah, thank you. That brilliant questions, actually. And um, important also because we have a very long tradition of debating in film studies. You know, was classical Hollywood really classical? What is the place of modernism in? this cinema that we can, so a costume to call classical, what is the place of melodrama in a cinema that we saw the costume to call classical, how come you know, industrial apparatus uh, uh, made art uh, 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 takes the form of the classical. And to my knowledge, it would be a good time to prove me otherwise, if, if anyone knows, these are debates that haven't really touched upon the um, aspects of acting. They've been revolving primarily around narration and maybe pictorial style and as it happens there is a very specific sense of what is neoclassical acting because a whole century of the during the 19th 18th century sorry that uh, a lot of european theater was marked by uh, uh, um, let's say neoclassical sensibilities i cannot um with straight face say that neoclassical acting was transported to Hollywood. They, they look very different, they speak very different, they move very different. They, they, that's, we don't have here a continuation, but neoclassicism um, as a concept, if we are looking at attempts to define aesthetics with accordance in according to the classics. And as you say, you know, a, a, a proportion, harmony, a, a decorum, then we have new ways of modeling the ancients onto contemporary artistic practice. Uh, a new sense of, you know, what is the quorum when it is done on camera, in film, in something that it's, it's moving. One thing that was really interesting um, to see to the extent that people are explicit about it in the early discourses is that they love to, um, more than anything else, distinguish between cinema of the teens to what came before. You know, back in the day, it was all about action. Back in the day, there was no technique at all. Back in the day, they were just uh, 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 cowboys or clowns or something. Now we have style. And then as they move forward, they are in some cases, but continuously, we see individual cases trying to draw back. Look like uh, uh, the, the well-crafted uh, sculptures of, of back in the day or do not uh, uh, exaggerate the way that uh, uh, the old styles would, you know, keep the decorum, keep the, this, this uh, uh, um, sense of harmony, um, and so on. So we have these kind of reappropriations of neoclassical sensitivities coming into a discourse that uh, uh, defines really a quite, well, very different from what neoclassical theater would be, but also trying to distinguish itself from uh, uh, earlier moments in um, in, in the history of film acting by that point. Thank you so much. That's really wonderful. And uh, I, I, um, I'm going to uh, take that and actually and parlay it into my next question, which is for Elise about techniques. Since uh, this is a, 
uh, you've all done a wonderful job of addressing these uh, key questions of our conference. Um, so, uh, Elise, uh, in your in your presentation on methodologies for madness uh, and instruction uh, manuals or acting manuals, um, I love your discussion of Anu's 1913 handbook, Motion Picture Acting, mm -hmm. uh, and her catalog of emotions and sentiments uh, that the aspiring photo player or um, should should practice from, mm -hmm. as you say, from rejoicing and tenderness to pity, uh, with, with pit, sorry, rejoicing, tenderness with pity, mm -hmm. um, and madness as, as they, you know, are supposed to practice in front of the mirror, right? Uh, and it actually, frankly, feels a little bit like this, uh, the, the last few months of this pandemic, <laughs> from uh, rejoicing uh, to tenderness with pity and then madness. <laughs> but, um, but so um, how do, uh, these how-to manual writers um, like Anu um, align with or depart from uh, theatrical practices and gestural methods alluded to by uh, Jenny, Veronica, and Doron. Um, what can you what can you tell us about? This is kind of a difficult question. So, kind of how do they align with uh, or depart from um, realist, classical, modern uh, Delsartian techniques that have been alluded to? Um, prior. Uh, what can you tell us about Anu's proposed techniques? And, and, uh, and then my second question, uh, I would like to extend it also to Maggie. Um, so both for Elise and Maggie and anyone who'd like to, to respond to it. Um, how does this imitation of mania through a uh, gesture or facial expression, or um, so this is more for Elise, how does this, uh, uh, and, and Maggie, but how does this imitation of mania reflect on um, as you say, Elise, racial and national ideologies or in relation to Maggie's presentation on cultural anxieties related to gender? And how can we, we see these uh, as resistant to the classical techniques that Doron addresses? And I cannot help but think about D.W. Griffith's 1912, The Painted Lady or The New York Hat, uh, which was screen, uh, scripted by Anita Luce. And classical style as, a, as kind of straight jackets mm -hmm. and uh, the nasty women comedies, as to take one example, as cures, right? So um, kind of in the spirit of, of Maggie's presentation, uh, how can we see the classical as a kind of straitjacket for certain of the of these elements and uh, or and and these comedies as cures right um, and then maybe I could parlay into a, ne a next question um, for Maggie and then I can open it up to everyone so Maggie you make a brilliant connection between Charcot's diagnosis of clinically pathological symptoms um, and early cinema as a medium of mass culture that converted modern anxieties into moving images. Uh, absolutely brilliant. And you discuss early cinema as an offering both as a diagnosis, uh, right, as converting these anxieties into moving images and as a visual cure uh, to uh, pandemic hysteria. So, um, as we think about crafts, the crafts and techniques of early cinema, what are the techniques of this diagnosis? Mm -hmm. um, and connecting to Ver Veronica Duran and Elisa's talks, um, how might we see these as a cure for classical cinema? And uh, any, uh, my final <laughs> question, ah, maybe I will say, well, okay. Many historians have explored the resonance of hysteria and, and neurasthenia for analyzing the visceral aesthetics, as you say, uh, of early cinema and mass entertainment or scientific research. And you say, uh, yet, um, and this is from your, your presentation, cl clinicians of hysteria have only, uh, um, have used filmmaking for research and medical showmanship. Um, but despite early scant medical film archives on hysteria, uh, the question is what can we ascertain about the politics of hysterical gesture in early cinema as a medium for social protest? Um, or how were hysterical symptoms parlayed into popular techniques of moving image representation and performance? Okay, so, the, so the, final, the final question is, how do these resonate in the current context of the pandemic and the protests for Me Too, hashtag Me Too, and most re recently for racial injustice in mm. um, Black Lives Matter in the US and abroad? That's my final question. And mm. I'll, I'll turn it over to you all. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I wanted to respond to, to 
uh, I can respond to, to several, I think I can respond to several of those questions um, at once, which is this question of decorum and, and um, this sort of the, the, the classical or neoclassical line versus excess, versus spillage, versus, versus um, uh, overacting. Um, you know, and, and, you know, I, I, one of the things I do get into in the paper is how even, you know, ni early 19th century um, acting books, which had a higher, uh, you know, goals that, you know, you're, they're coming out of Diderot, they're coming out, they're coming out of philosophy, right? They're coming out of these, these high art ideas, um, are, are arguing that, that, uh, you know, for decorum, not to overact, not to, not to, and, and, and also connecting to the medicine of the time. Don't let the bile come up. Don't, don't, you know, don't, don't engage with, with those, those um, dark humors, right? So it's, it's, it very much was about, about, uh, you know, arguing for that. But I think with the film acting text, I, one of the quotes I had um, that I think, you know, one of the biggest differences between the film acting uh, uh, booklets versus um, even the Descartes, I mean, Descartes was also sort of rooted in philosophy, a lot of it, you know, but, she, you know, she, the, the one of the, um, uh, uh, I think, uh, Jean Bernique's uh, text, you know, saying that you're going, you know, the actor is going to need to summon up this emotion on the spot. And she says, the, you know, study a broad range you know, lest, lest it leave the director uh, disappointed. And she says, he's pleased or incited to blankety blanks according to the manner in which the emotions are simulated. So there's that, that you have to be on the spot. Okay, now you have to be happy. Now you have to be angry. Now you have to be mad. You have two seconds go, money's going, money's going, right? Money, the, 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 the you know, the, that, 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 that I think, um, is underlying so much. So that a question I think was in the chat of, uh, uh, you know, whether or not the directors utilized these acting tech, acting, acting books, I think that they just wanted, they just wanted, you know, the immediate results often. I think that that idea of this sort of, um, although actually the, the article that both Daron and I used, this Sam Slapich uh, essay, um, he's also talking, he was, he turned out to be a sculptor. He retired in Florida as a sculptor. He was a classical sculptor. So he was saying to actors, you should model your emotions on, on the great, the great works of, of sculpture. So I think there was a tension. I guess that's what I'm trying to say is I think there was a tension. I think that there was this desire to have you know, they all are talking about don't overact, don't embellish, don't, you know, don't have this excess, which might be seen as racialized or not, you know, or from national, you know, and go, going back to Veronica's question about, about uh, stereotypes of I, the Irish, the Irish person, right? Don't do that. Um, and yet, as Maggie talks about, and I'll, I'll, I'll pass, I'll pass the, the, the uh, Zoom mic to Maggie, but, but this idea of, of making emotions visual, right? Making, making and, and aligning madness with emotion is the thing that I really discovered in all these books is they just, they just dump madness into this list of emotions as, as not as a, it's something psychological, but it's all externalized. It's all made visual. It's all, uh, it is embellished and it is made spectacular. And it's interesting in terms of thinking about whiteness and as a kind of, uh, I would say as a, it's, you know, uh, thinking about maybe the Griffith versus Oscar Michaud during that period or thinking about the kiss uh, and then the, the, the minstrel street minstrel the um, version uh, and um, yeah, as a kind of straitjacket, I think, um, and uh, a kind of a regulation of the body, um, kind of thinking back to uh, the Stockholm Conference as or well. Shift, or sh sorry, or shifting with, with, with Painted Lady, it's all in the eyes, you know, so it isn't about this big, she's not dancing, she's not writhing on the floor, it's all, you know, it's all this sort of mad, 
madness expressed just through the just through the eyes right. and, and, and the techniques of kind of zooming in more closely yeah. on her face and we think about like Sarah Bernhardt's historical uh, movement that Victoria Duckett has written eloquently about. And, uh, and I, I know, for example, uh, Jaume Dulac's first actress, Suzanne Debré, who was the wife of Louis Nupo, the father of symbolist theater in France. Uh, and she told her, don't move, let the camera do it for you. You know, don't, so it was this kind of, um, and that's even in, in the Impressionist context, right? And so that wants a kind of symbolist, um, express kind of expression um but it retains some of these abstract gestures at, at the same time so it's really uh fascinating to me and it, it retains them as a means the abstract gestures are where also uh some of the uh expressions of gender uh and uh, this kind of uh reaction against these cultural uh constraints and for example in the smiling madame bidet uh where she's in a kind of a literal prison uh of the home and we see the prison bars across the, the so there's this interesting uh yeah i find it just really fascinating um so um i don't know if maggie if you want to uh try to respond to some of these questions Sure, I'll jump in and I won't take too long because I see we're already almost at time and there are all of these rich, fascinating questions in the chat thread. But just to build off of Elisa's insightful comments about um, the kind of tension, you use the word tension, between uh, control and excess or precision and emotional expression that kind of hovers around the spectacle of madness, the topicality of madness. And then Tammy, I'll try to tie it back to your questions about what gender anxiety, race, uh, COVID, Me Too, um, <laughs> uh, collective social protests and all of the under, other sort of wonderful observations and questions you put on the table. One thing I'll say, so this paper stems from a larger project. I'm really trying to think about early cinema as a visual cure to rampant hysteria. So vis-a-vis -vis Charcot's clinic and the kind of epidemic of particularly female hysteria in the 1870s, I think one thing early cinema as mass entertainment spectacle did is democratize hysteria. So any, any film spectator, right, regardless of um, gender identity or subject position could be a hysteric. And that was on the one hand invigorating. Hysteria is fun and it had, I mean, um, so I'm, I'm tracing a number of kind of interrelated archives. So one is the um, experiment or practice of film exhibition in mental asylums. Um, the kind of palliative power of the medium for treating um, uh, people suffering from delusions, um, melancholia, psychosis, because there's something about the similarity between film illusions, particularly in trick cinema, and delusional hallucinations that was similar that it could have a kind of therapeutic or curative potential. So I'm trying to understand that sort of curative potential of early trick filmmaking and slapstick comedy in particular on a, on a mass level, on a popular level. Another question I have, so Charcot used photography extensively in his clinic. Um, I mean, it was a very panoptic space, the medical asylum, and it was all about kind of the autocratic pronouncement of his expert gaze, whatever sort of taxonomy or meaning he attributed to Blanche Whitman's unruly symptoms, that was the law, that was the word. But um, going back to Veronica's earlier comments about naturalness in acting, instead of natural, I would use the word organic here because that was what was at stake in the hysterics performance of her symptom in the clinic to prove that she wasn't a malingerer, a faker, that these symptoms arose from organic causes, even though those causes were to a certain extent inexplicable, unseen by the naked eye, even though Charcot searched obsessively for lesions in the brain. So photography was a really crucial expedient tool for Charcot to use in his clinic in order to kind of prove the truth value of the, the, at the same time, this kind of like gimmicky, pandering, totally exploitative spectacle of these women, these like poor traumatized women having epileptic seizures in front of like an audience of 400 um, men in his clinic. Um, photography was, you know, the in, it, it was associated with the indexical value of the unseen cause of the hysterics, baffling symptoms. But, 
as much as medical cinematography um, was an important component of early cinema, um, and you know, Scott Curtis, Oliver Gakin have written about this topic at length, Genevieve Aubert, I think Hysteria for some reason missed the mark of medical cinematography, um, which is bizarre. You'd think it would be a very useful tool. It has partly to do with some scandals of, um, uh, I mentioned briefly in my paper, Eugène Louis Doyen, who filmed um, his craniotomy operations and uh, one of his cameramen duped the surgery and it was like exhibited in Europe at like fairgrounds and the circus and all these CD venues and was sort of a scandal in the medical community. But I think it was more than that. And I think it's related to the thing I discussed earlier, why medical cinematography didn't catch on in research on hysteria. It's related to the democratization of hysteria um, within the early kind of formative mediums, uh, systems of representation. I'm particularly interested in comedy and trick films because I just love them, especially with the nasty woman like Leontine, who Stephen mentioned. Um, I know you mentioned COVID, but I better stop talking to leave time. <laughs> okay, Maggie. I'm just going to take a question from the chat. I'm having trouble seeing some of them in English, so I might ask Valentine and Clara to pop in. But one of the questions that was for all of the panelists that connects to what you just said is that some of the sequential images of emotional expression that uh, you have raised, um, I made this person think of Muybridge's movement studies, but applied to expressive facial movement. Um, do you think a larger scientific approach to the concept of motion breaking down movements into step-by-step -step progressions might have influenced um, the Del Sartre system of stage acting and later film acting manuals? Uh, is there a connection we can draw um, in movement uh, to the, the, the manuals and to... Uh, I'm having trouble seeing the English here, only the French, but um, so that one was Clara had sent to me. Um, oh, that was from Gwendolyn. That was a question from Gwendolyn. Um, and let's see here. Um, uh, I have from Clara n numerous questions in French. Maybe, maybe um, I can help, um, Tani? Yeah, thank you. Thank yeah. you. So um, one of the uh, um, one of the main question was from Louisa Alvim, uh, and it's it was I, I just read it. Um, I was. I was very interested in the concept of naturalness that Doron explored in his paper, and I wonder if you could detail a bit, a little bit more in the context of early cinema. It could also apply to Elise, uh, as she mentioned the acting manuals and how far of how close were they to a certain conception of naturalness in acting. I'm thinking about some studies taking opera singer Geraldine Farrar in her acting in cinema. Some of them mention her naturalness. Uh, maybe I just put another question that was, and so you can choose between, between them and, and go, um, because we, we are really late. So uh, another question was from Jenny Oyalan koloski uh, and it's, uh, my question is for Doron and Elise. You compellingly analyzed the recommendations of these acting manuals trainings programs. Uh, do you see evidence that filmmakers of this period adopted these ideas, craft techniques? I know we do see uh, this a little bit with the Del Sart. If not, why do you think these systems were not widely adopted? And a final comment was about melodrama and the, melo and the influence of, of uh, melodrama as a model for, for this. Yeah. And we started a, a little more than 10 minutes late, so we still have, you know, you can still take, I think, five, 10 minutes. I, I can respond to, to some of some of those questions. I mean, the uh, the, the gestural manuals, um, there are there were gestural manuals even in the late 18th century, early, early 19th century, 1820s. That one of the ones that I wrote about Siddons was from 1820s, that was actually based on Engel from Germany, which was even a little earlier. So those those um but it's very interesting because if you look at the charcot um you know the the pamphlets and the medical texts coming coming out of the salpetriere uh there were there were illustrate gestural illustrations of of the fit that were illustrated very very similarly and then once they started the photo lab you did you saw those represented photographically and it's at exactly the same they used the same kind of uh, chronophotography uh 
uh, devices that were being used by uh, Muybridge. So it was that was that was at the same time, like eighteen late eighteen seventies, um, eighteen early eighteen eighties, that they were using the same kind of you know. And actually, my my, uh, my first introduction to to the the Charcot uh, as an undergrad was in that idea of sequence photography, the, the showing the fit through sequence photography. Right. Um, There's a literal example of that, and it's slightly later than our period, but um, in 1922 by Germain Dulac, where um, the movement of the the man that rescues the woman from her her home, which is like a, a prison, is uh, a direct reference to Marie, uh, Margaret Marie's motion studies uh, with the tennis racket moving in this arabesque in a very slow motion. So this um, the, there are some very direct links, um, but it's I'm yeah it's interesting to see how this is moving through during this this period of the, the teens. The the question, if I may jump in at this point. Uh, the question of the, the influence on, on actual acting practices and, and directors uh, and actors on the scene is, is, is tricky because it's hard to trace. And because, as I said, these in the paper, these manuals are kind of the paper trail that we have behind what was uh, uh, thought about acting. But yet they are for primarily for film fans, primarily for amateurs. And the actual influence that we see in the studios is... Uh, um, from actors bringing from the theater. Um, and of course, very, we just have the, a window of about a decade of Hollywood style proper before things change with the, with the coming of sound. Um, so that's why I'm very careful throughout the paper to talk about, you know, discourse of acting or understanding or kind of reframing what, what it would actually be. And if anything, maybe the writers see at least the important filmmakers and the use from them, uh, um, there might be influence. I'll be very careful in, in saying in public that, that there is one. So the question of naturalness, um, I, it should not be confused with naturalism as, as a, a, a you know, aesthetic tendency or, or, or a theatrical style or genre. Um, and if we are talking about classicism, then uh, let us remember that one of the important thrusts of uh, uh, neoclassicism is idealization of nature. She's kind of the opposite of what I understand these actors to say when they emphasize naturalness. They talk about, you know, lifelikeness or very, very similitude to, to how we actually are. And what I felt was significant, it's not yet, you know, how actually I am versus how I am on screen mediated by the camera and, and, and everything, but uh, what the camera allows us to get from behavior, performance, acting, uh, differently from the stage, which is something that commentators celebrate in the transitional era. You can be more natural on camera than you are on stage. You are in the real world and not in artificial set. You, you have the close up. Uh, um, you, you don't need to, to, to act to a big space. So um, it's naturalness, uh, uh, again, on maybe on the same kind of continuum, but not quite naturalism, definitely not idealization of nature but uh, uh, it's, it's a term that keeps uh, uh, concerning everyone who's trying to articulate an idea on acting. Yeah. Thank you, Doran. Does, uh, were there other questions or other comments, responses? Or uh, would, Maggie, would you like to return at all to the question that I asked you <laughs> about the cure? And uh, because this is this may be our final remark before our concluding remarks for the conference. I think yet again, mass hysteria is very much on the table. It's like that's the zeitgeist of our moment. Um, and I know I don't want to delay things too much, but just thank you again, Tammy and uh, all of the organizers. Uh, I'm just so amazed by all your hard work this week. And it's really just been a delightful conference. So that's all I'll say. Okay, thank you so much, Maggie. Thank you, um, Elise and Veronica and Doran. <laughs>